And don't say it's because Florence was oh, her own issue. Mary Wells had her issues too, girl. All Florence wanted to do was drink a slit, smart liquor bull. That goddamn Mary Wells was on that boy. Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com for, yes, Baba, these Miss Chi Chi shades. They are back and in full effect. Remember, all shades at uptopbeauty.com mm -hmm, are $20. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's continue talking about Miss mm -mm -mm, Mary. What? Don't be mad at me about my uh, fingernails, but I'm taking this off because y'all know we're trying to save money here because, like I said, I'm going back home. To help Wells, the foundation publicly solicited contributions for Mary. Its existing grant program, a low-profile effort, had offered ailing artists $3,000 to $5,000 each, but Bruce Springsteen, a member of the organization's advisory board, immediately upped the ante. He gave the foundation's Murray Wells Fund a badly needed boost by donating $10,000 to it. Springsteen, usually discreet in such matters, announced his donation to the press, saying he wanted it publicized to encourage others to help Wells. Another member of the board, Anita Baker, a Detroiter like Mary, held a benefit concert on Wells' behalf that raised another $10,000 for the ailing star. Like, let me tell you something. Between Anita Baker and Frankie de Beverly, I'm telling you, they could come down to the D.C., the DMV, perform Monday through Friday. You hear me? Wherever the venue, big or small. And D.C. will show up for them every time. You know why? Because D.C. is very loyal when it comes down to their music. Once we choose you, you're chosen. Which, reflecting back to the Anita Baker. If she ever needed a residency, that would be what it is. You know, like at the Las Vegas. And if one more person asks me, Nate, come on, let's go see uh, Usher in Vegas. I'm going sm to smack him in the mouth. Listen, my if Anita Baker wanted to retire, if Frankie de Beverly wanted to retire and just have old residency, okay, and just chill and just get up and just be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go around there to the hot spot and I'm going to sing me a song, shoop a doop, boop, 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 and make me a couple of thousand dollars, he can do that. They can do that in D.C. Trust me, easily. Oh, D.C. loves the Frankie de Beverly. And Anita Baker. Springsteen had learned of Wells' problem when he invited her to sing duets with him for what would be his next album, Human Touch. Because Murray was unable to accept, Sam Moore performed on the album instead, as did several other vocalists. Other musicians also helped Wells. Her old intro group, The Temptations, gave $5,000. Rod Stewart gave $10,000. Donna Ross and Aretha Franklin each gave $15,000. Barry Gordy, $25,000. And Bonnie Raitt, Martha Reeves, Phil Collins, Robert De Niro, and Frank Sinatra gave undisclosed amounts. Now, I know Martha Reeves ain't give a whole bunch of money. That bitch probably gave $25. I love you, Martha Reeves. I do. I don't have no problems with you, Martha Reeves, but we know your ass was singing on the circuits with her. So you was just as broke with the, the damn Mary Wells, Martha Reeves. Okay, plus we know that you all, you, you was a little crazy. By September 1990, her friends and fans had raised more than $55,000. A year later, they had 
raised a total of $150,000. Meanwhile, on Motown's 13th anniversary television special, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, and Gladys Knight performed a tribute to Wells. After her initial medical treatment, Wells' first need had been a place to live while she underwent her prescribed weeks of chemotherapy and radiation treatment as an outpatient. Let me tell you why I think the old Motown artist stood up and jumped in there to help Mary. What happened to Florence Ballard will always be a guilt festering in their gut. And they know goddamn well there were things that they could have done to intervene and they didn't. So what they used was this opportunity to redeem themselves and quell that gnawing guilt in their gut for letting Florence Ballard get to the level that she did. And don't say it's because Florence was, you know, her own issue. Murray Wells had her issues too, girl. All Florence wanted to do was drink a slit, smart liquor bull. That goddamn Mary Wells was on that boy. I really believe that they stood up. They really had to stand up for Mary Wells. After her initial medical treatment, Wells' first need had been a place to live while she underwent her prescribed weeks of chemotherapy and radiation. Moore had found a room for Wells and her five-year-old daughter, Sugar, in a Grand Hyatt Hotel, only 10 minutes from the hospital. Finding the room was not a prolonged process, but easing Sugar's fears took a bit longer. Sugar had nightmares, Wells told a reporter who interviewed her in this room. She told me, Mom, don't do this to me. Please don't do this. But she's now running the show. She got in the elevator yesterday and announced... My mother's going to the hospital to get treatment. Harry, the 15-year-old son of Cecil and Mary, had been living with Curtis. Mary and Sugar before Wells went to the hospital. But after his mother became ill, he was sent to live with his older siblings. The fact that the foundation paid for Wells' room and medical treatment and gave her taxi passes to help her get around helped Mary financially. Shortly after her radiation therapy was completed though, she was offered a chance to do a lot better than that. When Wells found herself seriously ill and nearly penniless, she began thinking a lot more than she usually did about the money her Motown songs had been making over the years. It's no exaggeration that I helped build Motown, Wells often said, usually adding that she hadn't been sufficiently paid for her achievement. In truth, no one foresaw how popular Motown music would be years later or that Mary would sign away all her rights to future royalties. She was mentioning this to Curtis one day after she became ill, and Curtis said he realized he had just recently seen something in the newspaper about Stephen Ames Brown, a San Francisco entertainment attorney. What caught Curtis's eye was a story reporting that singer Marsha Walsh had sued for credit and royalties for the vocals she had performed on several hit records, including CNC Music Factories. Gonna make you sweat. Brown, an attorney who had represented many entertainers, was representing Walsh. Okay, so let me tell you about Martha Walsh. You know that's one of Sylvester's... Um, Damn, I forget what he called them. But they were eventually the Weather Girls. Okay? Martha Walsh's voice. Ooh! Oh, gonna make you sweat. Such a tragedy. How things back in the day were considered so... Ooh, like taboo. But they're so okay now. You know, and vice versa. Because you know, back in the day, you could smack a woman on camera and it's fine. But you better don't now. You, be you better not. I was watching I Love Lucy the other day. And I was like, Ricky Ricardo is literally spanking Lucy on camera. And this shit's okay. This shit ain't okay. What happened was 
if you did not have the visuals that I guess the public found appeasing and you were a singer, child, they would throw someone in place of you. Millie Vanilli got exposed for not being the actual singers of that song. Whatever song it was, I can't remember, but I mean, they were the face of the song, okay? Just like CNC Music Factory. You thought that old, skinny, beautiful black girl was singing that song. Hell to the no, it was Martha Walsh, okay? Oh, Two Tons of Fun. That's what Sylvester's uh, girl group, Two Tons of Fun. Martha Walsh was singing a song. I was like, ooh, that little girl, she can belt. Damn. Well, Max suggested that because Wells could only whisper, he would call Brown and ask Brown to represent Wells in a suit against Motown for back royalties. Womack did so, and very soon afterward, Womack said Wells made a deal in which Brown would demand $100,000 in back royalties from Motown and keep 40000 as his percentage. Mm -mm -mm. Brown knew that former Motown Records president Ewart Abner, still on the Motown payroll as a consultant, had argued truthfully in media interviews that Wells had agreed under her 1964 court settlement to waive her future Motown royalties. So Brown said he spent three days alone in his law office going over and over the documentation from the settlement, attempting to find a loophole. Finally, he realized that although Motown owned the right to her voice, the company had never demanded or received from Mary her written permission to use her photograph or her name on any recordings to be sold by Motown after she left the company. What? You say what? He added this to the suit, demanding another $100,000 plus for this offense. Brown said... He then called up Gordy and said, feel free to continue selling Murray Wells records. But from now on, unless we come up to an agreement, you'll have to sell them without her picture or her name on them. This, he said, led to a quick monetary settlement. The amount was not disclosed. <laughs> Let me tell you what the Murray Gordy said with his patty ass. Years later, Gordy indicated the depth of of his annoyance with Wells' heavily publicized claims. Let me tell you about Murray Wells, he told the Cleveland Plan dealer sarcastically in 1994. She was sick in 1992. She was with Motown from 1960 to 1964. We got her many hits. No, she got too many hits. Motherfucker. She left in 1964 with a number one hit. My guy, 20th Century Fox paid us a royalty to get her out of her contract with us. She went to five other companies. Then after 27 years, she didn't have any money. So now it's Barry the Gordy's fault. Well, nigga, she got you the most money. Wells was hopeful throughout her ordeal. In September 1990, while unable to speak at all and receiving daily intensive radiation therapy, she mouthed the words, the doctors say, I'll be all right, to a USA Today reporter. She then added in writing, I'm going to beat this. As Claudette Robinson told Unsung, Murray truly hoped that there would be something they could do that would get her back to being the same Murray Wells with the same voice. Joyce Moore told USA Today that although Wells was very, very scared, she's confident that she'll be fine. But Mary's situation was worrying on her. She mouthed optimistic statements to many reporters but confessed to one scribe i can't get used to this you can't imagine how hard this is for me during this time she told bergsman i would rather die natural or commit suicide than die of a disease like this an apparently accidental snub lowered 
her spirits. When rap star MC Hammer gave a weekend concert in Los Angeles, he invited singer Janet Jackson, basketball star Magic Johnson, talk show host Arsenio Hall. Child, Arsenio was a very big deal then. Like how, you know, if you're a black person and you throw events, you damn sure better have invite the Obamas, okay? And if you can get uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce there, I mean, goddamn, that would be even better. But back then, if you wanted the best of the best there, it would be Arsenio Hall. MC Hammer gave a weekend concert in Los Angeles. He invited singer Janet Jackson, basketball star Magic Johnson, talk show host Arsenio Hall, and Mary to visit him before the show. Jackson, Johnson, and Hall were admitted, but after Wells had waited 20 minutes, a security guard told her that no one else was welcomed to have an audience with Hammer, according to news accounts. Chow, ooh, could you imagine? Oh, that ninja would have been fired immediately. What? First of all, bitch. Why do you not know who Murray Wells is? That's royalty. Wells said she was embarrassed and humiliated by the incident, which Hammer said he had been unaware of. He apologized and called the situation unfortunate, saying he highly respected Wells. Hammer said the offending guard was not his, since his personnel don't handle anybody that way. That's what the Hammer said. Don't handle anyone that way. And or offered to fly Wells to one of his upcoming concerts as his special guest. But her daily treatments prevented her from taking him up on his offer. In February 1991, Wells got good news. Her doctors told her that the radiation therapy had eliminated the cancer. The development cheered her up immensely and her appearance soon improved. Steve Bergsman said she once again became lustrous, pretty, and sexy. As her energy returned, Wells immediately told Joyce Moore that she would resume her career by lip syncing to her old songs while her voice recovered. I mean, she should have been doing that. I mean, I know the audience, audience, sir, ma'am, please, them, they, audience, you know I'm over here struggling with the, with the thing, okay? You know I'm struggling. So I'm going to give you the best performance I can while I lip sync. I mean, you just dealt with it every Saturday on the Soul Train. So why I can't do it? I'm like, I'm going to 